It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Tom Porter, MD, Chair of Cardiology and Professor of Internal Medicine, University of Nebraska Medical Center, Omaha, Nebraska. Dr. Porter. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to speak uh, with you um, regarding uh, the use of myocardial contrast echocardiography specifically for perfusion imaging. And uh, the I uh, just want to say a couple words about International Contrast Ultrasound Society. Uh, this is a, a very good collaborative um, working group between radiology, cardiology, hepatology, vascular, uh, gastroenterology, physicians, sonographers, nurses, scientists, uh, and the industry, which all benefits the patients because we are all working together to improve patient care. And that's really the heart of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, when we talk about the what the ultrasound enhancing agents uh, provide for us. Uh, it's important to know, though, that being a member of International Contrast Ultrasound is really available for any of you listening out there right now. The, the, there's free CME, free website access, uh, and several uh, wonderful places to go on the website, uh, and updates that uh, are sent to us regularly regarding uh, ongoing literature being published with ultrasound enhancing agents. The specific agenda that we'll be discussing today uh, with Dr. Senior, my colleague uh, from London, is uh, how we can use myocardial perfusion imaging in different settings. And this first talk uh, will uh, basically just discuss uh, in brief uh, how we do a perfusion assessment uh, with an ultrasound enhancing agent. These are my disclosures. And the objective of this talk will be to look at both quantitative and qualitative approaches to myocardial perfusion imaging with ultrasound enhancing agents. Now, when we say ultrasound enhancing agents, uh, we are referring uh, to commercially available microbubbles. They are uh, small in size in general, somewhere between one to two microns in size, uh, though some have variations in this, but the useful ones are probably around that size. And uh, as best we know about them, they serve as free intravascular tracers when they're microbubbles. And they are not taken up by the myocytes like radionuclide uh, tracers are. Uh, though, as you know, we're compared quite frequently to uh, that type of imaging technique. So we'll include a little bit about that uh, in this discussion. And what's most fascinating about the microbubbles is that they respond linearly and non-linearly to ultrasound. What do we mean by that? Well, ultrasound is a transmit frequency. And so you see we transmit ultrasound at a given frequency, typically fairly low for transthoracic imaging so uh, that we can uh, penetrate the chest wall of our patients. Uh, and uh, the response of tissue, uh, when we just have a very low mechanical index setting on our uh, ultrasound uh, transducer is quite small. Uh, it uh, reflects linearly what the uh, transmit frequency was. As we get to a little higher mechanical index, you may see some harmonic imaging. And as we get to a real high mechanical index, the one that you use day in and day out for non-contrast imaging, you get a lot of harmonic activity. And as you know, that's what most of our transducers do today is look at harmonic uh, ultrasound. But go back now to that very low mechanical index uh, where we're getting very little response from tissue. Uh, and surprisingly, at that very low mechanical index, that's typically less than 0.2 uh, on your system, so you get a, a, a fairly robust, a fundamental response from the microbubbles uh, and harmonic responses, as you can see here. This fundamental response is nonlinear, which means it's not responding at that uh, quite the same kind of sine wave or phases. Uh, and amplitudes that your transmit frequency did. And this is a rather robust signal. Uh, and for the past 25 years, the ultrasound manufacturers have taken advantage of this when we do ultrasound enhancing imaging is that we try to image that nonlinear fundamental response from the microbubbles uh, in various different mo modalities, um, either using an alternating amplitude signal uh, or an alternating amplitude and phase signal all of those kind of cause this fundamental nonlinear response uh, that uh, creates that robust signal, which because it's at a low frequency, uh, doesn't uh, attenuate nearly as much as the harmonic responses that we had typically been using for microbubbles in the past. Uh, 
where we get a nice response in the near field, but a lot of attenuation in the far field, because here we're transmitting at 1.8, for example, frequency and receiving way up at 3.6 megahertz, uh, which means we only really get uh, the advantage of seeing the micro bubbles in the near field. And here's an example of that. Uh, your typical afternoon uh, four chamber image that you'll be looking at uh, after this webinar uh, in a patient that's uh, maybe 300, 250 pounds, or maybe even not that big, but still has a lot of attenuation because you're imaging them in the intensive care unit, okay? Uh, you can't get them turned on their side optimally and, and the image quality is not very good. If you switch to just the harmonic uh, uh, ultrasound transducer, where now you go to, to transmitting at 1.6, but receiving at 3.2 megahertz. So you do see some nice contrast in the near field and lo and behold, yes, there is an apex that you can visualize here. Uh, but the uh, near field is, uh, uh, is not very visible, visual, or able to be visualized uh, because, or the far field, excuse me, is not very uh, easily visualized because of this high frequency uh, receiver signal. However, if we use this uh, fundamental nonlinear imaging technique, you see a very, this is basically a, a flip of a button here. Uh, now we're going to the 1.8 transmit, 1.8 receive frequency. Now we have nice uh, LV opacification and myocardial opacification because of this robust response we get uh, from that uh, fundamental uh, nonlinear response. But there's minimal attenuation in the far field. So we can analyze. LVO, which is the FDA approved indication, and this perfusion, myocardial perfusion, uh, in, because of the uh, ability to detect these micro bubbles uh, in the my microcirculation. And uh, as we'll talk about now, how we can look at myocardial perfusion uh, uh, in, using this fundamental nonlinear uh, signal. Now, what do we need to know about this? Well, but the human coronary circulation is basically divided into arteries, capillaries, and venous networks. Uh, and about 90% of what we call the microcirculation is in the capillaries. Uh, and we have about 8 million capillaries in our hearts. Um, and so when, for the red blood cells to get through them uh, at the flow rate, remember the, the, uh, the cardiac output, about 10% of the cardiac output uh, goes through the coronary circulation. The red blood cell velocities, uh, in order to get through them, all these capillaries, um, uh, and out through the venous end, they have to travel about one millimeter per second. Red microbubbles, as we said, are serve as red blood cell tracers. So when they're uh, administered in an infusion or with a small bolus uh, with a, a slow flush, they are transiting through these capillaries. And the elevation plane of that uh, typical 2D uh, image uh, that I showed you uh, in that patient in the intensive care unit uh, is about four millimeters. So the micro bubbles, if they're uh, tracing normal uh, capillary blood flow, should replenish any imaging plane that you're trying to uh, detect the microcirculation in, in about four seconds, because it's about one millimeter per second uh, and about a four millimeter elevation plane. Uh, if you give a high mechanical index impulse and clear the micro bubbles of the microcirculation, they'll replenish that field uh, at about one millimeter per second. Uh, and about within four seconds, you should be back to that plateau intensity. And that uh, rate of replenishment um, is called the, it correlates with the red blood cell velocity. Uh, while the plateau intensity that we achieve, it correlates with the capillary cross-sectional area. And what that typically looks like uh, uh, from a cartoon perspective, this is the original work of, of Kevin Way back in 1998 when we uh, discovered this phenomenon, is that you clear the microcirculation with that high mechanical index impulse, then go back to a, that very low uh, 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 mechanical index, uh, nonlinear fundamental imaging uh, technique, uh, and analyze this replenishment as a function of time. Uh, and by typically, as we said, four seconds uh, with a typical transducer, you should be back to this plateau intensity. That red blood cell velocity is detected by this rate at which uh, replenishment occurs or the slope, the initial slope of this replenishment curve. And the capillary cross-sectional area is that plateau intensity. The combination of these two, uh, velocity times cross-sectional area, gives us myocardial blood flow. And we know that that plateau myocardial contrast enhancement uh, that we see during a contrast infusion or small bolus injection 
Typically, again, should reflect the ultrasound contrast concentration that's in that area. There are some problems, uh, though, with attenuation of the beam, even at that fundamental nonlinear uh, frequency that we're using. Uh, and that regional difference in attenuation can be accounted for, uh, and any inhomogeneities in the ultrasound beam can be accounted for uh, by dividing the myocardial uh, plateau intensity uh, by the adjacent left ventricular cavity intensity to compensate for these uh, inhomogeneities in the beam uh, or any attenuation from the contrast. And what that looks like here from a quantitative perspective is that in this basal segment of the apical four chamber uh, and mid segment here, you have a typical contrast intensity at the plateau intensity. And then you have an LV cavity, uh, which uh, reflects the blood pool here, uh, which has, but has to undergo the same degree of attenuation that the myocardial region adjacent to it does. And by compensating for that, uh, we can subsequently do uh, a, a measurement of absolute myocardial blood flow. And indeed, that was done by Vogel in Bern, uh, Switzerland, where uh, myocardial blood flow was actually calculated and compared with uh, a much more expensive and difficult to uh, uh, obtain technique called uh, N13 ammonia PET. Uh, and uh, when that was uh, utilized as the gold or reference standard for myocardial blood flow, uh, myocardial contrast echo uh, was utilized to calculate myocardial blood flow using that relative blood volume or that uh, plateau intensity uh, normalized for the adjacent left ventricular cavity intensity. Uh, and the product of that times that rate of replenishment divided by the tissue in, um, density uh, uh, for myocardium uh, was then used to compute myocardial blood flow. And when they compare that to uh, N13 ammonia PET, you can see there was a very close correlation between myocardial blood flow calculated by myocardial contrast echo and uh, this, uh, the myocardial blood flow uh, calculated by PET using uh, N13 ammonia, uh, which ammonia, excuse me, which is, um, uh, you know, requires a cyclotron to generate uh, and is very difficult to uh, utilize on a daily basis. But here we now have a bedside technique that over a wide range of myocardial blood flows can be used uh, to quantify that uh, at the bedside. And this was uh, the breakdown of that work. These were patients here uh, that had varying degrees of coronary artery disease, and these are normal volunteers here. Uh, and this is uh, during hyperemic uh, uh, stress, which uh, Roxy will be talking about uh, in uh, a, mo a few moments. Uh, and this is during resting imaging. But over this whole wide range of flows, uh, we were able to detect uh, myocardial blood flow in, in absolute terms. And that is much different than what we see uh, with standard uh, nuclear imaging techniques that were used day in and day out to uh, assess myocardial perfusion. For example, technetium, uh, you can see here, uh, when it is correlated with myocardial blood flow, uh, only can correlate linearly with myocardial blood flow over a very small region of the types of myocardial blood flows that we uh, look at day in and day out uh, at rest or with stress, uh, where you're up here in this category. Once you get past a certain level of myocardial blood flow, the technetium uptake, because it's a poorly diffusing tracer, whether it be uh, any of the, 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 the brand names out there, correlates very poorly with changes in myocardial blood flow. So it is not really a myocardial blood flow technique. It's basically a myocardial blood volume technique. Uh, in fact, in this particular example here, uh, the, the, le the flow in the left anterior descending is four times the flow in the left circumflex. But you don't see any differences here in the tracer uptake, which is shown here. This is the plateau intensity uh, with myocardial contrast echo, which also reflects myocardial blood volume. But once we do that replenishment curve, we can see that here the replenishment of contrast in this region is much faster than this region. And that helps us detect these differences in myocardial blood flow with myocardial contrast echo that we cannot do uh, with radionuclide stress imaging because all it can do is look at that plateau intensity. So what we do in analyzing uh, whether it be rest or stress perfusion imaging is give a brief high mechanical index impulse, like you can see this apical three chamber view during uh, or after, uh, during a contrast infusion or during a, 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 slow, a small bolus of ultrasound enhancing agent. And then we analyze the replenishment uh, of that myocardial contrast as a function of time and either visually assess 
uh, myocardial uh, perfusion, looking at that rate of replenishment, which, which we said should be within four to five seconds under resting conditions, and certainly uh, double that uh, during stress conditions, or you could be quantified. And both techniques have been utilized uh, in terms of detecting that. Now, one caveat to that is that we typically, this is again work from uh, Howard Leon Poy uh, uh, when he was at University of Oregon, uh, showing that uh, that correlation with myocardial blood flow, which is very linear when we use this uh, slope of the rate of re replenishment, uh, 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 the product of that and the plateau intensity is very linear uh, relationship as long as you're looking at the uh, our near end systole. Uh, you wanna make sure you're using that as opposed to end diastole uh, because at end diastole you have arteriolar interference which will uh, make this relationship much poorer quality as you can see here when they looked at diastolic uh, myocardial contrast intensities is the end systolic intensities or near end systole that you wanna use because then you're predominantly looking at the capillaries uh, which, as we said, certainly during hyperemic stress are the major regulators of coronary blood flow. So getting back to just evaluating these patients, okay, that we see day in and day out uh, with the techniques we have available to us. This was a patient in the emergency room that was 48 years old, a uh, history of smoking, had came, come in with chest pain. And I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more uh, after uh, Dr. Senior's talk. Uh, but this was, again, a, a situation where you were asked to look at this patient. They had non-diagnostic EKG changes, uh, and but had a smoking history. Uh, and because they were having intermittent uh, uh, left precordial type of pain, a resting echo was obtained uh, after the troponin came back uh, slightly elevated, uh, but not changing. Uh, over the function of time with the high sensitivity troponin, uh, but the EKG changes were clearly non-diagnostic. And on the two-chamber view, you really can't appreciate as much as you'd like the endocardial border definition. And certainly, as you know, since we're not administering any ultrasound enhancing agent, we can't really see the perfusion either. When we administer the ultrasound enhancing agent, uh, you can see that now we have good endocardial border definition. So we've achieved the one goal of using the enhancing agent, and that's to improve our endocardial border de uh, definition. But now you saw that little flash that cleared the myocardium of the contrast right there. And we can analyze that replenishment at end systole here uh, by looking at the end systolic images. And you can see there's a resting wall thickening abnormality and uh, myocardial perfusion replenishment abnormality. In other words, you don't really see any replenishment occurring here after that high mechanical index impulse in this basal inferior segment. And indeed, this was a severe right coronary artery stenosis uh, that was causing the chest pain in this patient. So that was visually assessing myocardial perfusion, uh, which is a very helpful technique uh, where you use the eyeball, as you can see here, uh, to look at uh, the myocardial contrast replenishment at that at various time periods uh, following the high mechanical index impulse. And as we said, certainly by within five seconds, that should have all replenished. Uh, while during any kind of hyperemic stress, which Dr. Senior will be talking about, that should have replenished uh, much more rapidly, typically within two seconds. Uh, and, and in this case, this was a resting image and a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can see maybe some delays in replenishment here uh, in certain segments. And that's the advantage of this is that not only do we have the ability to visually analyze this, which is what we do day in and day out uh, in the echo lab, uh, but we can quantify this. And this becomes helpful in conditions like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, where there may be um, a, uh, a uh, uh, resting myocardial perfusion defect that we can't necessarily visualize. And this was some work, again, recently published uh, uh, by the University of Oregon group, looking at qualitative and quantitative myocardial perfusion techniques in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, where they observed under resting conditions uh, that these hypertrophy segments, like you can see here in this patient here that has septal hypertrophy, uh, as well as the non-hypertrophy segments, had lower myocardial uh, blood flow velocities and lower uh, uh, myocardial blood flow measurements, even under resting conditions in both the hypertrophy and non-hypertrophy segments. Now, that wasn't necessarily visualizable. Uh, uh, but was quantified um, as being different under resting conditions when they looked at the actual contrast intensities as a function of time. The visually evident abnormalities, though, could be observed during a vasodilator stress uh, in that you could see, as you can see here, transmural uh, 
uh, uh, myocardial perfusion defects or delays in replenishment following the high mechanical index impulse uh, uh, in segments that weren't even hypertrophy uh, in patients. And these not only were visually detectable, but easily quantifiable uh, and uh, tended to occur in both non-hypertrophied as well as in the hypertrophied segments. So to summarize this first part of the talk, myocardial blood flow can be detected with the real-time myocardial contrast echo techniques that you're using right now uh, to look for left ventricular opacification. It's all added information to the FDA approved indication and over a wide range of flows with the, the correlations with uh, uh, reference standards like ammonia PET uh, are excellent uh, and uh, clearly better than what uh, radionuclide SPECT can do with the current tracers we have available to us that are typically technetium based. It should be assessed, as we said, near end systole. It can be quantitatively assessed. Uh, and uh, as a segue now, we'll talk about well, a little bit later how we can use it in the resting setting again in clinical scenarios. But now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Roxy Sr., who will talk about the stress assessments of myocardial perfusion imaging. Dr. Sr. Uh, is a, a professor of uh, clinical cardiology at the National Heart and Lung Institute um, at the Imperial Pol uh, College in London. Uh, he's also serves as a cardiology consultant. I don't know how this guy has the time to write all these papers. He's got to be reading a lot of echoes too, because he's also the uh, uh, cardiology uh, consultant and director of the echo lab at the Royal Brompton Hospital in London, London and the Northwick <laughs> Park Hospital. So he's a busy man, but very well known and well published in this area of how we take this information we were just talking about and apply it to several different clinical scenarios that we're faced with uh, and how that can be used in the stress assessment uh, uh, of, of patients uh, so that we can use both the wall motion and perfusion data. Dr. Senior. Uh, thank you, Tom. I'll just share the screen. Yeah, I'll stop sharing there. Sorry. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, so Tom, can you see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. <clears throat> so, thank you, Tom, very much for this very kind introduction of myself. Um, so, just moving on from uh, Tom's where Tom left off regarding uh, using myocardial perfusion for the sorry, my video. Right. Uh, okay. No, that's fine. Uh, for the assessment of ischemia and myocardial viability in the clinic. So essentially, which Tom has already alluded to, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, this is a, a cast of a coronary artery tree with the epicardial arteries and myriads of vessels here, which uh, we, uh, as Tom has described, this is really microcirculation of which capillaries form 90% of it. <clears throat> but the reason for showing this is that we should know that ischemia can occur as a result of you know compromising of the micro, micro of the circulation anywhere from the epicardial artery down to the microcirculation so any compromise of any part of the circulation can cause ischemia if the myocardial oxygen demands the compromise of the circulation so when we talk about ischemia we are really going to talk about ischemia not only of the epicardial coronary arteries but also of the microcirculation so so what are the causes of my myocardial ischemia? The causes are obstructive coronary artery disease, which we all know, but we know that the prevalence of coronary artery disease has come down quite significantly over the period of time. And now non-obstructive coronary artery disease, also known as ischemia in patients with uh, 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 non-obstructive coronary artery disease has become, has, is playing a prominent role uh, when patients present with uh, chest pain. So the causes of those are vasospastic uh, disease, sorry, vasospastic disease, and coronary microvascular disease, and amongst which the causes of uh, uh, coronary microvascular disease are non-obstructive coronary artery disease. So even if there's no obstruction, non-obstructive uh, coronary artery disease can also cause microvascular abnormality. And cardiomyopathies like Hokum, which Tom has described, dilated cardiomyopathy, um, uh, rest restrictive cardiomyopathy, inflammatory myocardial disease, and primary microvascular disease 
especially in women who present with chest pain, which is becoming more and more uh, common. As we see patients presenting with chest pain in women where obstructive coronary artery disease prevalence is much lower. So now when we do a stress echo, the premise on which the stress echo detects myocardial ischemia is based on eliciting wall motion abnormality. Now, if you look at the, so this is looking at various levels of the myocardium. Uh, uh, so you, you can see that the endocardium actually provides the most in terms of uh, thickening, myocardial thickening. So you can see on the right that the endocardium, that is the inner third of the myocardium provides 58% of myocardial wall thickening at rest. Now, because with ischemia, especially with epicardial coronary artery disease ischemia, or you know, uh, 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 narrowing, the ischemia occurs mainly in the subendocardium, and because the ischemia occurs mainly in the subendocardium, the wall motion abnormal, the wall motion is affected straight away, and if it is severe, it becomes akinetic. So you can imagine that if ischemia occurs in the rest of the myocardium without affecting the subendocardium, there will not be any wall motion abnormality. In fact, the wall motion can be completely normal. And this can occur in microvascular disease. Microvascular disease is a widespread microvascular affection, which affects patchily the whole of the myocardium, and it may spare the subendocardium, and as a result, sometimes we don't see uh, wall motion abnormality despite the patient having a lot of ischemia. So that is one of the drawback of just looking at wall motion. So now coming further down into what other uh, issues are with wall motion assessment. So if you look at the relationship between perfusion during demand stress, uh, such as using dobutamine stress echo or exercise stress echo, now this is looking at dobutamine. So at low level of demand, say 10 microgram per kg per minute in a patient who has significant narrowing of the coronary arteries, the coronary blood flow goes up due to direct vasodilator effect. Now, because there is a stenosis in that region, the hydrostatic pressure drops in the capillaries and the only way the capillary can maintain uh, a capillary pressure Transcapillary pressure is by de recruitment of the capillaries, which increases the resistance. Hence, the pressure across the capillary bed is maintained. And because of capillary de recruitment, you see the perfusion defect. Because, as Tom has explained, what we see, the signal intensity coming from the myocardium during myocardial contrast echo, is nothing but the uh, signal from the capillary, especially in end systole. So, you see a perfusion defect. But because there's not much of demand on the myocardium, which is a product of contractility, blood pressure, and heart rate, you, the, there's no ischemia occurring as such because the demand hasn't exceeded the supply. So there's no wall, you will not see any wall thickening abnormality at low level of dobutamine stress echo with um, uh, severe stenosis. But of course, as you increase the demand, the demand will now uh, increase beyond what the blood can supply to the myocardium. Um, and there you see, and then you see, I mean, the perfusion defect is there. You'll see the perfusion defect anyway, but then that precipitates wall motion abnormality. But also one must remember that perf even if there is a perfusion defect, if the perfusion defect does not exceed 10% of the circumference, you will still not see wall thickening abnormality despite high level of uh, oxygen demand such as during exercise, during uh, dobutamine do do stress echo, like in single vessel disease or mild coronary artery disease. So you're likely to miss a mildly obstructive coronary artery disease or a single vessel disease. And this is very nicely shown in this study from the University of Virginia. And you can see here with dobutamine, you don't see any wall thickening abnormality, but this is a flash replenishment imaging during dobutamine. And you can see the replenishment is very much delayed in the circumflex territory here. So this patient, or rather this um, um, uh, model, this animal model had, had a circumflex uh, 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 tied up, 
which is causing ischemia, but there's no wall motion abnormality. So now that is also a problem, just looking at wall motion with stress echo. And finally, we, we, we know that you know, we use exercise dobutamine diapredomol for stress echocardiography. And you can see the highest uh, myocaloxin demand that is the product of uh, blood, systolic blood pressure and heart rate is the greatest with exercise and then followed by dobutamine. And finally, the, the lowest, the lowest, sorry, highest is with exercise, then dobutamine, and the lowest is with diapredomol. And you can imagine then, or you can understand based on this, what the sensitivity and specificity of looking at wall thickening abnormality during demand ischemia would be. As you can see with exercise, you have the highest sensitivity because you actually impart the highest myocardial demand on the myocardium and followed by dobutamine and least by diapredomol. So when you do a diapredomol uh, uh, stress test, just looking at wall motion abnormality is certainly not good enough because you're going to miss a lot of, uh, a lot of coronary artery disease. You need to look at perfusion. Now, dobutamine is good. It's still 82%, but still, you're like, it is missing, as you can see, 18% of the patients you're missing when there is severe stenosis, albeit mild stenosis. So, in short, the advantage of, the disadvantage of just looking at wall motion abnormality during stress echo are that you do get false negative tests, with dobutamine stress echo because it does not impart the most myocardial demand or with premature termination of any stress. And when there is less than 10% perfusion abnormality, such as mild coronary artery disease or single vessel disease, microvascular disease, as I've said, and of course, I didn't mention this, but I'll show you an example in severe left ventricular hypertrophy, and I'll tell you why. So now with, with stress echo, which we do, we can look at perfusion, as Tom has shown very nicely, we can look at perfusion defect, but we use contrast anyway to assess wall motion uh, during stress echo. Uh, in my lab, we use contrast, uh, 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 you know, um, ultrasound enhancing agent in nearly 90% of patients. So it's just a switching of, not even switching, because we are using the very low mechanical index setting, contrast specific setting, looking at wall motion and all you need to do is look at the myocardium that's all you need to do and you will see perfusion and so i'll show you an example how it helped in my day-to-day -day clinical practice uh, because we looked at myocardial perfusion so this is an example of a patient who's only 61 years old well i mean he's in a range where he's likely to have coronary artery disease but the patient presented with very atypical chest pain now the patient flew in from the middle east to the Royal Brompton Hospital, not directly, but by the airport. <laughs> we don't have a Harry Pad or anything. Uh, but, um, uh, and all he wanted to know is whether, you know, the chest pain that he's having is because of coronary artery disease. It, 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 patient came to one of our interventional cardiologists who referred the patient straight away the same day or the same time to me. He rang me and said, can you please do a stress echo and tell me whether the patient has got coronary disease. So this is a stress echo that we perform. So apical four chamber, apical two chamber, apical three chamber. On the left is the uh, uh, rest, and on the right uh, is the stress in each of these pairs. And now you can look at it. I've, I've slowed it down so that you can look at wall motion very carefully or wall thickening very carefully. You will see that looking at it, I don't see any significant wall thickening abnormality except maybe right at the apex in the three chamber view, some delay in a very small segment of this uh, you know, area. And normally if I see this with this atypical chest pain and during exercise, the patient did not complain of any chest pain, I would maybe pass it off as normal. But we do, we do look at perfusion during exercise. So this is perfusion. Now, if you look at, uh, look at the perfusion here, there's a four chamber view. And there's a flash coming up now, meaning you clear the microbials, and now you see how quickly it fills basally, but apically there is a perfusion defect, and you can see it nicely in its end systolic triggered mode. So we do real time on the left, and we also do triggered mode. Look at 
at only ancestrally because that gives us a better appreciation of perfusion abnormality. And you can see that the base inferior septum and mid are very well filled. And also the mid anterolateral wall right at the base is an artifact. You can see it's an artifact because you can see the defect extend, extending into the left atrium. But at the top, you can see a clear subendocardial defect. And, uh, and you can see the whole of the apex, I mean, post segments of the apex is underperfused. And this is the two chamber view that you are going to see now. Uh, it's taking a bit of time because I've slowed it down. And you see now with the two chamber view very nicely, the same apical defect. Now, so the patient, instead of flying back to uh, the Middle East, flew into the cath lab and had an angiogram done. Now, so if you look at the angiogram, you can see there's a blocked LED. And the reason why wall motion was abnormality was not that prominent is because a lot of collaterals from the circumflex supplying the LED. So limiting the amount of ischemia that the patient is likely to have. And this is very nicely shown here with just perfusion abnormality, but no obvious wall thickening abnormality. And this patient essentially obviously would have been missed if we had not done perfusion. Now, another example of another patient, a 44-year-old male, this time with no, no normal coronary arteries, uh, and, but the patient is getting chest pain. So the question is whether the patient has got ischemia. So are we dealing with inoka or ischemia without uh, uh, obstructive coronary artery disease? So this is a stress echo on rest and stress. Now, this is the wall motion. You can see two chambers completely normal. The four chamber is also completely normal. May not be, you know, but it's certainly much better than at rest. You can see at rest, the ejection fraction is, uh, is better in the right than on the left, but still it's, it's possible that there's something not quite right, but it's not very clear what's going on. So, so this is the perfusion of this patient. So you can see now, so now look at the slow filling of the myocardium. It takes about 10 seconds to fill, right? Very slow filling. Now, if it's normal, it would fill straight away. Now look at this. It's three cycles gone, still very underperfused, and then gradually filling up, but very patchily. And this is a reduction in flow velocity of the, uh, of the uh, of blood flow uh, as a result of uh, probably arterial problem that this patient is having, but not causing wall motion abnormality because much of it is in the mid myocardium or sub epicardial region, very little in the sub endocardial region. Now, this is a study done by uh, uh, Tom Porter uh, team. And you can see he has shown very nicely that what is the outcome of such patients? Now, these are patients who underwent myocardial contrast echocardiography and these patients don't have flow limiting coronary artery disease, but you can see if the wall, the blue line is where the wall motion is normal and the perfusion is normal, the outcome is good. But where the wall motion is normal, like in this case, while there's a lot of perfusion abnormality, the outcome is bad. And of course, if both are normal, the outcome is really worse. So this clearly shows the importance. Now this patient otherwise would have been uh, a discharge saying that, okay, you don't have ischemia, you can go home. Now, this patient is now being treated properly, uh, correctly, because we could, we could see perfusion abnormality, which, would have, which we would have missed in terms of ischemia by just looking at wall motion. Now, another example of this is, okay, this is regarding a patient with significant left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, you can see this patient's got a lot of hypertrophy. In fact, this patient's got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, what you see here is, uh, in a patient with a normal wall thickness, right, of 10 millimeter, with a normal radial strain of 30%, will thicken by three to four millimeter. Now, when the wall thickness increases to 20 millimeter, the same wall, even if the radial strain has come down to 20%, because it's not normal, the wall will still thicken by four millimeter. So in other words, despite abnormality of the myocardium, and you can see this is the strain imaging, and you can see there's a lot of abnormality in the myocardium. So longitudinal fibers, you know, the longitudinal fibers are affected because of ischemia and because of high end diastolic pressure. 
and yet the wall thickening abnormality is maintained. And so that is the problem doing stress echo in patients with very thick ventricle because you will still not be able to discern wall motion abnormality uh, uh, because of the reasons stated here. So now, this is an example of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has come with a shortness of breath mainly, but they want to exclude ischemia as a cause of shorter shortness of breath on top of, you know, uh, uh, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So now, if you look at wall motion here, two, uh, four chamber, three chamber and two chamber. Certainly looking at wall motion, I will not call that the patient being ischemic because, you know, it, it looks normal to me. But if you look at perfusion here, so there's flash coming up and this is, look at the perfusion. So this is in two beats and you can see there's perfusion defect in the apex throughout and the anterolateral region. So a lot of perfusion defect in the apex and anterolateral region. And this patient was sent for angiogram and this patient had three vessel disease. So again, the usefulness of myocardial contrast echo during stress. And then we come to another scenario, left one branch block. Now this is a patient who presented to us uh, with shortness of breath. And the question was asked whether the patient has got coronary artery disease. And clearly the LV is normal at you know, four chamber, two chamber, three chamber, you can see the apex is not contracting well. The, um, um, the infralateral seems to be thickening, but even then that's not normal. Now, during stress, you can see that the anterolateral wall is contracting well, the inferior septum is contracting well, but the apex remains poorly contracting. So the question is whether it's an infarction or ischemia. Now with wall motion, it's very difficult to say because it could be any one of them, right? And actually this patient should have had a dobutamine but had an exercise, but still the wall motion remains abnormal. So patient may have a myocardial infarction. Now we did a study uh, where we showed that if you do stress echo and look at just wall thickening with, using contrast, uh, the wall thickening score index at peak stress gives us a good, uh, is a good predictor of mortality because it combines LV function and inducible ischemia. Now, but if we look at just inducible ischemia and take out the uh, LV function, and if you send the patient for coronary angiography based on uh, ischemia because of the wall motion abnormality that you see, you will find that out of 17 patients that have been referred with wall motion abnormality during stress, nine only demonstrated coronary artery disease. So this is like flipping a coin, whether the patient's got coronary stenosis or not. Now, when this patient underwent perfusion, which we do, now look at the perfusion. Despite all those abnormalities, the perfusion was completely normal. So what we are saying is the, the, the wall motion abnormality is due to entirely due to left one branch block and maybe underlying cardiomyopathy, but certainly not due to coronary artery disease because the perfusion was completely normal and there's no infarction. And this is a study that we did where we compared uh, myocardial contrast echo with SPECT and we showed that the sensitivity of myocardial contrast is like 85% and the specificity is 90%. As you can see here, it's completely normal, no coronary artery disease. And while look at, if you look at SPECT, the sensitivity and specificity are equally not good. Now, both wall motion abnormality uh, in left branch block and perfusion abnormality on SPECT suffers from uh, underlying pathophysiological problem. The first one is because it's left branch block and contractility is uh, affected. While with SPECT, you see partial volume effect and see false perfusion defect but MC overcomes both these issues. And so in a series of patients that we um, studied in our lab, we found that MC detected significantly more cases of ischemia than wall motion in the LAD territory, detected greater ischemic burden than wall motion on per patient basis, and MC correctly identified a greater portion of patients with multivessel disease than just wall motion alone. 
And if you look at outcome of all these patients, so this is looking at outcome in 2,239 patients in three different studies. The first study is by Tom Porter published in 2005. You can see that if the wall motion is normal and the MC is normal, the outcome is excellent. But any perfusion abnormality uh, compromises the patient's outcome. And this is shown throughout in the next study also, where Tom Porter worked with Nicola Gaibazzi from Italy, and they showed again in a large number of patients the same phenomena. And this is our study based on uh, over 200 patients showing again the same curves as you've seen before. So no wonder now in both in the European guideline, in American Society of Echo guideline, and in the ICAS guideline, that myocardial contrast echo uh, has been advocated as, uh, as a class 1B indication or class 2A indication uh, in, uh, uh, in patients undergoing stress echocardiography if the lab is sufficiently, uh, has sufficient expertise in performing contrast. So I can actually stop here, Tom, or I, I can talk on a bit of myocardial viability. What do you suggest, Tom? Have uh, I got time? There may be a few brief points on myocardial viability would be great. Okay. All right. So very quickly. So, so essentially what we saw in the pre previous slides is, right, uh, which Tom has also shown, is when we look at a still image uh, after in infusing contrast, the, the signal intensity from the, uh, from the myocardium is really capillary blood volume. And, and you can see a very nice correlation between the capillary area and the signal intensity in this biopsied material from a patient with ischemic cardiomyopathy. Now, what does this capillaries actually represent? Now, this is a study uh, experimental model from University of Virginia where they ligated the LAD territory and injected contrast. And the so ligation was for six hours. They injected contrast at the end of that. And what they found is, so this, what you see is a, is, a, is a, you know, loss of signal intensity in the LED area, in the septum. Now, if you look at, and when they looked at the, uh, when they looked at the tissue slice of the myocardium and did, and did a TTC straining, staining, you'll see that the myocardial infarct size is similar to what the capillary loss is shown here. So in other words, in acute phase, when there's capillary loss that represents Michael, in, uh, loss of myocyte. So there's a very close correlation. And this is also shown by one of our studies um, in patients with acute myocardial infarction. And you can see this patient had a large myocardial infarction of the LED territory. And you can see there's no uptake of contrast here. And you see a transmural defect on, uh, uh, on MRI. And if you look at the relationship here between the transmurality of infarction and the signal intensity, you will see that the greater the transparency of infarction, the lesser the signal intensity. So, so the signal intensity, the capri volume, loss of capri volume mimics or rather uh, depicts myocardial necrosis in this acute ph phenomena and an acute case. Now, in the chronic phase also, if you look at the signal intensity, the loss of signal intensity is related to collagen deposit. So the lesser the collagen deposit, the more the signal intensity. And this is also taken from a patient, patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. And, and we've also shown that the, uh, when we looked at the recovery of function of these patients that undergone myocardial infarction, myocardial contrast echo is an independent predictor of recovery of function, suggestive of myocardial viability. And it also uh, can predict mortality. As you can see, the greater the degree of uh, perfusion abnormality, the higher the mortality is. And I'll just show you one uh, um, uh, case example and then I'll finish. Now, this is a patient presented to us with three vessel disease, but very poor ventricle. And they wanted to know whether the patient has got viable myocardium, viable and ischemic, viable myocardium definitely, because the patient's got severe three vessel disease. Now, if you look at this, this is at rest, this is at low dose, intermediate dose, high dose. Now, if you look at the intermediate dose and if you, uh, calculate the ejection fraction, there was no difference in the ejection fraction. So in other words, there's no contractile reserve at all in this patient. So we cannot say for certain that the patient has got viable myocardium in terms of good amount of viable myocardium. But when we did a uh, myocardial contrast echocardiography in this patient at rest, now if you look at it, uh, 
you can immediately see the signal intensity throughout the myocardium. So that suggests there's a lot of myocardial viability. In fact, if you say that the signal intensity may be coming from tissue, but you can see nice destruction of the microbials and replenishment suggestive of you know, viability. And when we did it at peak stress, you'll see there's a lot of ischemia. See, look at the slow filling of the myocardium and perfusion defect. So this, and the patient then underwent revascularization. On the left, you see the ejection fraction was only 20% before revascularization and post revascularization, most of the myocardium has recovered, is increased to 40%. So essentially the reason why this disparity occurs sometimes with stress echo uh, is because, it, and this is a study looking at a, a con contractile flow reserve in patients with hibernating myocardium. And if you look at beta reserve, which is a flow reserve, you will see that the value of beta reserve is very similar to the value in necrotic myocardium. So many of these patients have very low coronary flow reserve. If you give a little bit of dobutamine, you'll induce ischemia, and therefore you will not see the contractile function. While contrast echo, and this is a quantitative contrast echo, you can see the uh, capillary volume reduces gradually as from hibernating myocardium to necrotic myocardium, it is significantly reduced. That's why Hibernate, so um, use of contrast can actually improve detection of hibernating myocardium. And this is um, uh, uh, looking at uh, meta-analysis of all the studies in, in myocardial viability, looking at contemporary techniques. You can see with dobutamine echocardiography, it, it has got a good sensitivity and good specificity. There's no question about that. But if you use contrast echocardiography, your sensitivity certainly improves to uh, significantly to 87%. So, so in, in our lab, the way we use it is if, if you do an echo and if the myocardium is, for example, the LED tetra is generally thin and hyper echoic, you can say straight away is non-viable. But if it is thick, more than six millimeter, and you give dobutamine, if there is contractile reserve, it is viable. But if not, then do a perfusion imaging. If it is homogeneous, it is viable. If it is not, then it's likely to be non-viable. So with this, I would like to uh, close the session, or not the session, my talk. Uh, essentially, you know, detection of myocardial ischemia using wall thickening is well established. I mean, there's no question about that, but the use, but wall thickening only can have problem because of, you know, not enough of myocardial workload. Uh, vasodilator, with vasodilator stress, you must, uh, wall motion abnormality can, may not occur. And with mild coronary arteries, you may miss it. And you may also miss in severe LBH and in coronary microvascular dysfunction. And of course, we must not forget left one branch block that, that has a problem. So perfusion assessment during stress echo enhances ischemia detection and viability detection and risk stratification. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Senior. Again, the very excellent presentation on the stress uh, aspects uh, of the uh, 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 contrast uh, echo. And now uh, we will finish this uh, seminar by uh, discussing uh, what um, the use of myocardial perfusion uh, imaging, the very things that Roxy was applying during stress imaging, how can they help us in terms of looking at some of the resting studies where we're asked to evaluate chest pain uh, and uh, uh, in, in intensive care settings or emergency settings. And again, we go back to this replenishment curve, again, where we're using it for the real-time, uh, very low mechanical index, fundamental nonlinear imaging, and analyzing wall thickening, and analyzing perfusion at the bedside in a patient that has chest pain or has recently had chest pain, how does that help us? Is, is, that, is there that same incremental value that Roxy showed us uh, uh, on the uh, stress side of things? And again, as we know, uh, we have uh, changes to the technology that are occurring uh, day in and day out with our transducers. Uh, and, uh, uh, but fortunately, uh, up to this date, uh, we are using um, the three-dimensional transducers now more frequently. And what we found with that is, is that we need to use even lower mechanical index imaging to still get that fundamental nonlinear response, but to reduce noise uh, uh, and uh, improve uh, our ability to detect perfusion, uh, we uh, put the focus behind the mitral annulus and go down to about 0.1 to 0.12, which you saw that's about what Dr. Uh, Senior was using on some of their images. 
Now, when is this helpful? Well, we have found that this is very helpful for evaluating any kind of acute or recent chest pain in any setting, okay? Uh, both when they're having pain or even after the discomfort has resolved, uh, it is very important if there's a suspicion that myocardial ischemia may be playing a role uh, to use the perfusion and wall motion data simultaneously to evaluate the patient. And then uh, it's helpful prior to in a chest pain evaluation patient prior to stress testing and even following revascularization. We'll show you examples of where this has been and studies where this has been very helpful, especially in the setting of, of microvascular flow following uh, emergent percutaneous coronary interventions. Now, I'll just start with an example. This is an 18-year-old male, uh, past medical history of Marfan syndrome, uh, had a valve sparing aortic root replacement with a reimplantation of the coronary arteries, though, uh, because of the, uh, as you know, that most of their uh, problem is at the si in the uh, sinus of Valsalva. So that a uh, graft was put in, a valve sparing graft, uh, but the coronaries were reimplanted. The patient began having some chest pain uh, postoperatively. Um, uh, and uh, when we looked at the uh, uh, resting images here in the apical two-chamber view, uh, you can see we uh, saw, oh, this, is, this is just the end systolic image here, at the plateau intensity. This is before the high mechanical index impulse is administered. And since we're transmitting again at 1.6, receiving at 1.6, we see minimal attenuation down here. Uh, uh, and you can see a very impressive resting basal inferior perfusion defect that in this young patient, we're seeing ischemia and uh, reductions in myocardial blood flow and the wall thickening abnormality uh, because of a kink in that right coronary artery uh, graft that was, uh, or coronary artery that was reimplanted into the graft. Here you can see that again in real time where Virtually, even before the high mechanical index impulse, we're dealing with a, a, a defect here. So we have a reduction in both capillary cross-sectional area and uh, that re uh, red blood cell velocity in this territory, uh, and seeing both a perfusion defect and a wall motion abnormality. Now, that's an example of where it was very helpful. That patient uh, had a fairly large infarction because the surgeon didn't do anything about that a finding on the echo. Uh, but it goes to show you that it's very helpful to evaluate these patients where you suspect some other maybe non-coronary cause could be causing uh, the, uh, the, the chest discomfort and the ischemia. Also, you can use it when the discomfort uh, has resolved. Um, this is an example of a 60-year-old patient with chest pain uh, seen in the emergency room, a uh, history of methamphetamine in use, uh, came in uh, for evaluation of a prolonged episode of pain, uh, uh, temporarily related to using methamphetamines, but it was no longer present. There were no EKG changes, but there was a slight elevation in the troponin. And as you know, about uh, a, with the high sensitivity, sensitivity assays we have now, uh, it's very hard to really use the troponin value to kind of risk stratify because if they come in jogging, they have an elevation. Uh, and, and so uh, here, uh, echo is used to say, well, is there any evidence of ongoing ischemia that could be causing this pain. And these are the non-enhanced images here uh, that were originally interpreted as essentially normal wall thickening in the apical four and apical two chamber views. But uh, because uh, of some rib shadowing here, an ultrasound enhancing agent was used. Uh, and in this four chamber view where there really wasn't any rib shadowing view, you can see when we administered the ultrasound enhancing agent, a very obvious uh, wall thickening abnormality became evident in the mid anterolateral and distal lateral segments uh, under resting conditions with a delay in replenishment uh, in that territory, uh, which really was not evident where we're looking at basically uh, non-compacted myocardium here uh, on this uh, wall here that obscured our ability to see that and even made it look like it was fairly normal in that territory. And then in that two chamber view, uh, where it was clear the rib shadow was causing some problems. You can see that defect also extended into the mid anterolateral, or excuse me, mid anterior and distal anterior segments here, and was associated with a delay in replenishment, not only thinning of the myocardium, but a de delay in replenishment. And this was a large first diagonal occlusion at subsequent coronary angiography. And uh, uh, Kevin Way has looked at that a value of detecting, looking at wall thickening and perfusion in the emergency department uh, in patients that either have had ongoing pain or had recent chest pain uh, and uh, looked at the value before even the troponin value came back of 
what did the EKG and what did a quick assessment of regional function, RF, and myocardial perfusion do in terms of predicting death or non-fatal myocardial infarction in both uh, early and late uh, outcomes uh, in hospital and at 48 hours. And you can see that if a regional function and myocardial perfusion abnormality were both present, there was a 9.7 fold higher risk uh, that the patient was uh, going to have uh, infarction or die uh, within the next 48 hours. Now, if regional function was abnormal, but perfusion had returned to normal, in other words, a, a stunned myocardial uh, a segment that uh, still had the residual wall motion abnormality, that still was associated with a worse outcome, but not nearly as abnormal as if both were present. And so what uh, these uh, clinicians did was combined all these four variables here, any abnormality on the EKG that was changing uh, on, with, a, with, a, with chest pain uh, or any ST change uh, relative to no ST changes, uh, and then this regional function and myocardial perfusion assessment into a four-point uh, system, um, such that if you had both myocardial perfusion and wall motion abnormalities, that was two points. And you can see that if a patient had a score of zero in the emergency room that you were seeing in them with chest pain, and this is independent of all other risk factors or other TIMI risk scores or the heart score, if they were a score of zero, they could go home. They had about a 0.4% risk of having any kind of complication. So basically, you identified a very low risk patient. Similarly, a score of one was still a very low risk patient. Once you got to a score of two or above, you can see the frequency of a cardiac event uh, with or without any prior history of myocardial infarction uh, was significantly higher. And when myocardial perfusion became abnormal, you can see that's when we had the biggest jump in uh, the uh, incidence of subsequent infarction or death. Now, you could also apply that uh, in this trial, this uh, prospective trial, looking at patients that had chest pain either seen in the clinic or seen in the emergency department, and then uh, an outpatient a study was performed within the next week or so. And in that context, what this study did was randomize 2016 patients to just using conventional stress echo uh, to evaluate those patients uh, at rest. And then uh, it was also done during dobutamine stress. Uh, and then looked at the uh, instance of just resting wall motion abnormalities and perfusion defects that were detected in these patients. In other words, not in that acute emergency room setting, but after they had been sent home and then returned for a stress echocardiogram, the presence of a resting wall motion abnormality or resting wall motion abnormality and perfusion defect was the single most important predictor of outcome, independent of the stress echo results, independent, uh, independent of gender or other risk factors, or uh, elements of known CAD. If you had a resting wall motion abnormality that was still present at that time of follow-up study, which typically was in a, within a week of presentation, uh, that identified the group at highest risk and independently at risk for adverse outcomes, irrespective of the stress echo results. So assessing resting perfusion and wall motion in these patients that are referred from the emergency room, this could be 48 hours later, 72 hours later, also identifies a high risk group, very similar to what it did uh, in the acute setting in the emergency room. And when a meta-analysis uh, had been performed that involved over three, almost, uh, yeah, 3,700 patients uh, from uh, six different studies, uh, again, looking at that resting myocardial perfusion, resting wall motion in terms of predicting outcome, the presence of both a myocardial perfusion abnormality or, and wall motion abnormality when compared to when both were normal had a six-fold higher risk in these six studies uh, uh, of predicting death or non-fatal myocardial infarction or need for urgent revascularization. When comparing wall motion abnormalities with normal myocardial perfusion, uh, to when both uh, were normal. Uh, you can see that that was still a higher risk patient, but not nearly as high as when both wall motion and perfusion were abnormal. And when both wall motion abnormalities and myocardial perfusion abnormalities were present and compared to just wall motion abnormality being abnormal, but perfusion normal, that's again, identified a higher risk group of, a group of patients. So both abnormalities contributed uh, in predicting outcome. And when both were abnormal, it was a very high risk patient. And finally, we know that we can use that resting microvascular flow assessment uh, 
to reassess patients after emergent or semi-urgent revascularizations. For example, this is an example of a patient that had uh, a, a, an inferior and lateral wall STEMI and had also LAD disease. So both the uh, culprit vessel, which was the circumflex in this case, uh, and the left anterior sending were stented acutely. Uh, uh, and you can see here the stents in both vessels and very nice runoff of flow uh, in the circumflex. Uh, Timmy three flow um, uh, was evident in the circumflex vessel after uh, the placement of these stents. However, uh, when we looked at uh, the myocardial perfusion, <laughs> In this patient, after this beautiful flow had been achieved in the circumflex, uh, this is the plateau intensity uh, before a high mechanical index impulse was delivered. You can see a large resting basal mid uh, uh, anterolateral and distal lateral perfusion defect was still present. Uh, what does that mean when we still see that after we've restored epicardial flow, uh, as in this circumstance? Well, this happens most frequently. That was a circumflex example. I showed you there, but this happens most frequently uh, with left anterior descending uh, 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 occlusions uh, that present either a STEMI or with an LAE occlusion where once they're revascularized, and this was a patient that had come in with a, a anterior ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, had emergent within one and a half hour uh, percutaneous coronary intervention and restoration of flow in the left anterior descending. Then uh, shortly after that, we did this uh, contrast infusion uh, where you see that high mechanical index impulse delivered. But even before the high mechanical impulse is delivered, you can see there's already a plateau defect uh, in most of the LAD territory here uh, that persists uh, well past the high mechanical index impulse, in indicating severe residual microvascular obstruction. How often do we see that today? Uh, and we looked then at about a, a study of about 300 patients with anterior wall ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. And after, after successful percutaneous coronary intervention to see uh, how many times do we see a nice a normal replenishment like you see here, or four seconds after the high mechanical index impulse, uh, there's replenishment uh, to one where there's a, a delay in replenishment, uh, says that uh, at four seconds post high mechanical index impulse, there's still some residual perfusion defect, but eventually uh, by eight to 10 seconds, there's replenishment uh, versus those that do not exhibit replenishment. Like the example I just showed you, uh, where there's persistent microvascular defects uh, well after the high mechanical index impulse. Well, look at this. Uh, you can see that their outcome, uh, and, and this is the event-free survival, need for defibrillator uh, and death and recurrent infarction and heart failure rates. If this is the group that's had uh, persistent microvascular defects all the way out to the plateau intensity, highly significant, worse outcome, almost a 60% event rate uh, in those patients. Those that had delayed microvascular replenishment, still had a significantly higher event rate, uh, but not nearly as bad as when uh, the plateau intensity remained abnormal. And then this group here that had normal replenishment still had some adverse outcome, but only a 20% adverse outcome. So you can see this marked risk stratification that we see by analyzing the microvascular perfusion and the wall thickening following an intervention. So we have these many applications for myocardial perfusion imaging. Now, why are we using this more frequently? Uh, despite its uh, tremendous value, we're only seeing minimal utilization. Uh, and uh, it's possible because this quantitative software we talk about where we quantify the replenishment, the manufacturers have not really done anything with it. It's still very burdensome and difficult to apply in a clinical setting. I, you know, visually assessing, we can do day in and day out, but quantifying, which seems to have more value, is much more burdensome to do. Uh, artificial intelligence applications have not been developed yet uh, for perfusion imaging, and, and we need this um, uh, as this will help us in, in teaching uh, as well as applying this technology. And as we said, the new three-dimensional transducers tend to introduce more noise, uh, lack of background suppression, more near-field dropout, uh, and this all makes it more difficult to visually assess the myocardial uh, perfusion uh, uh, information that we've just been presenting during stress and rest. But regardless, the ability to use stress, as Roxy pointed out, and resting myocardial perfusion, as I just showed you in the most recent clinical studies, this is available on all systems. It has very important applications 
the resting, uh, particularly in evaluating chest pain patients, either in emergent ICU settings or post-operative settings where there may be, like I showed you in that 18-year-old, a possibility of, of, of coronary ischemia, but especially in the emergent evaluation in the emergency room uh, of chest pain in an intermediate risk patient, and even in a low risk patient, it's probably very helpful uh, to work these patients up. And uh, if, you, if they are sent out and sent back in a, a for a repeat stress or for a stress echo 48 to 72 hours later, even then the resting assessment of perfusion and wall motion has been shown to be very helpful in predicting outcome. And finally, in evaluating microvascular flow after interventions. And with that, uh, we will open it now for questions. Uh, as uh, you know, there's probably a few questions out there about the utility of this uh, uh, in a wide variety of clinical settings. So uh, please uh, feel free to ask some questions. We have uh, some, a good amount of time now. We've saved this amount of time uh, to take your questions. Thank you again very much. Roxy, I, I'll start, I'll kind of kick things off and uh, ask you a question. Uh, you've also, uh, I, uh, I believe, done some um, uh, work looking at uh, the utility of, of myocardial contrast echo, as you pointed out, in, in just evaluating patients with dilated cardiomyopathies uh, that come in. Uh, yeah. and, and we don't, as, as you know now, there's, there's, the question is, do we get an MRI for viability? Do we get a CT to look at their coronaries? But uh, you have shown that... Uh, uh, I think that the with uh, myocardial contrast echo, you could uh, risk stratify those patients quite well, uh, independent of whether they have coronary artery disease by quantitative evaluation. Could you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, no, it, that's right. So <clears throat> I, I always perform myocardial perfusion imaging when patients come to me with uh, heart failure and uh, 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 chronic heart failure, meaning the patients have developed uh, shortness of breath recently, I do an echo and there's LV dysfunction. So the question really is whether it is uh, ischemic or not. So I do a stress echo with contrast. And if the, if the, if the perfusion is completely normal visually, obviously I've ruled out any significant ischemia. But at the same time, the study that I did also showed that these patients do have reduced coronary flow reserve uh, but there may not be obvious, you know, perfusion abnormality, but they may still have low coronary flow reserve compared to a normal ventricle. So that that essentially shows that this patient has got underlying uh, a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and you don't need to go down very expensive, uh, uh, you know, MRI route to, uh, to actually evaluate this further. Uh, the only patients that I would send uh, in uh, in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy for uh, MRI would be those where I'm suspecting that they may have sarcoidosis or they may have, you know, other inflammatory uh, abnormalities that MRI can pick up. But generally, you know, 80% of cardiomy dilated cardiomyopathy are viral or genetic. And uh, they, you know, it, it, the treatment is right, just treatment for heart failure. So it's a good initial technique to actually uh, reassure yourself and the patient that, okay, you know, we're not dealing with this, but we're dealing with that. Right. So your algorithm is such that you use the, the perfusion stress echo as a, uh, a, a whether if that looks normal, the replenishment looks normal, yeah. even if you haven't demonstrated any contractile reserve, yes. uh, this is a, uh, a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Correct. Correct. And do you notice any differences uh, in the, the patients that exhibit a contractile reserve versus that don't in their perfusion patterns? I know you, because you looked at some of that quantitatively, and I think you yes. that if, if perfusion was quantitatively abnormal, that was also independent of whether they had coronary disease, uh, that was a higher risk group of patients. Correct. Right? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so uh, in a patient with dilated car cardiomyopathy would reduce a flow reserve, uh, uh, quant uh, obviously quantitatively uh, does suggest that this patient is likely not to recover that quickly and that well. Very interesting. Looks like we have a question coming in here. Uh, it asks us, uh, we can both answer this question. Um, how do your labs administer ultrasound enhancing agents during stress echo? Uh, 
Uh, what we uh, typically do is we use uh, a, a ha I would take the ultrasound enhancing agent, for example, uh, we use Definity, for example. Uh, we put half of that vial in about 30 milliliters of saline uh, and mix that and then uh, infuse it at, hand infuse it at about uh, three to four milliliters per minute. But the nurses do that while they're basically doing all the other things they do uh, during the infusion. Um, now, some would put it in an ID bag or something like that and infuse it that way. Uh, but then you have to remember to always keep it uh, well mixed for a continuous infusion. Uh, and uh, Roxy, is that some of what you do? You probably, you have the availability of the infusion pumps, right? Uh, yes. So, yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, we use Sonovi a lot. So with, for perfusion, generally uh, we give, uh, for example, if the patient is exercising, then at peak exercise, we give a bolus on the on the um, treadmill, and just before the patient comes of the uh, 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 of the exercise of the treadmill, then as soon as the patient lies in the bed, we connect it with the infusion pump, and the infusion starts when we are looking at myocardial perfusion, and then we look at perfusion uh, doing flash replenishment imaging. And that's your protocol for all your uh, treadmills. Uh... Uh, okay, so generally we have actually now uh, uh, narrowed it down to certain patients. For example, most do vitamin stress echo, we tend to do myocardial perfusion along with wall motion. On exercise, uh, it's only in those, those who have exercised at 12 minutes with no ST changes, no chest pain, you know, they're unlikely to have any significant, their prognosis is very good. But in those patients where I'm suspecting that this patient, you know, uh, has got a pretest probability, which is pretty high, then I would look at perfusion uh, simultaneously with wall motion. Okay, very good. All right. And that's, uh, so I think uh, the answer to your question, it appears that uh, the infusion, if you can get and uh, make that work within your system, either by hand infusion or uh, a, a flow pump, then that would be uh, the preferred way to go for uh, doing perfusion with the wall motion during exercise or, di or dipermol or vasodilator or dobutamine uh, stress echo. Uh, I think you can get by with maybe small boluses. That'll create little times where you have a little bit too much, a little bit uh, not, not enough contrast. So um, that makes it a little more uh, challenging, uh, but I, I, I think it could be done. I, we Now on our uh, resting echoes, uh, we do a small um, bolus injection. Uh, typically, if we have like, for example, Lumison up on, upstairs, uh, they'll give a 0.5 to 1 mil bolus uh, and then repeat that bolus. Uh, typically, we tell the nurses to repeat that with a small saline infusion every uh, uh, 30 seconds or so, so that, that they keep that uh, concentration relatively constant uh, while we're using uh, Lumison, because it's a little hard to teach all our nurses on the floor who will give contrast. Uh, to um, uh, to do the infusion technique. Here's some more questions here now. Let's see once. Uh, uh, the uh, second question here is uh, with echocardiograph echocardiograph echocardiography perfusion being so new, is it an, is it an accepted method uh, to use for clinical diagnosis and to proceed with further testing? This deals specifically with perfusion and aging. Uh, go ahead, Roxy. Okay, so uh, in our lab, of course, we use it clinically. We have been using it for a long time now, and it is an accepted method of assessing uh, myocardial ischemia. So uh, it is. It is not like okay. We've seen we've seen perfusion defect. Let's confirm it with MRI. It's no longer that in that stage. It has been. 15 years ago, but we've shown, you know, you've shown, I've shown, and many other investigators have shown that it works in the clinical scenario and helps to guide patient management. And, and, the, and the data that I showed, uh, you know, on over 200 consecutive patients is using it for diagnostic purposes in, in the lab to show that it works and that it can be done within the time. You know, it doesn't take a long time to do it. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it is done within the time that we have allotted for stress echo. And it yeah, works. I, yeah, I totally agree. I, I, that, that's been our experience too. It's now our standard of care uh, to utilize the, uh, both the perfusion and wall motion analysis for stress echo 
because it, it, it's very, uh, it basically integrates well within the current workflow of the lab. All of our uh, nurses are trained uh, to give the, the, the contrast uh, and, uh, and it's extremely safe. Um, we know that the, there is a, a very low risk of uh, anaphylactoid type of reaction, um, maybe one in 10,000. So our nurses are aware that uh, they, you know, need to have uh, an EpiPen available um, uh, and no life support for any kind of potential reaction, but that, that is extremely rare. Uh, and uh, the, the benefits clearly outweigh the risk. I think you've seen that from the data that uh, Dr. Senior's published and he's published in our group and several others uh, that have shown that we get added uh, uh, information uh, so it now is just basically what we do day in and do day out. So basically, since you know uh, 2005, uh, as, uh, Roxy pointed out when they published their first data on the dilated cardiomyopathies, and and we published the data on the dobutamine stress echo patients. It's become uh, a standard of care, and so we probably have, I say, 25 to 30 thousand patients. So we're not publishing all the data on all those patients, but hopefully we could use that database now. Uh, to uh, assist with some artificial intelligence methods to uh, allow, uh, you know, a lot of more teaching to go on and make it easier for labs to integrate contrast by just uh, using some of the machine learning techniques that are available. Because that one minus exponential function that uh, describes the replenishment curve uh, uh, is, is something I think machines can learn uh, and look at these different segments uh, and, and uh, help us with, you know, integrating that data uh, what we really need is to be able to ways to integrate that data with our busy labs. Um, and I'm hopeful that that will be feasible uh, with some machine learning. I agree. Yeah. The next question uh, is, um, in your labs, do the nurses administer the ultrasound enhancing agent or do the sonographers uh, during stress echo? Well, in our lab, unfortunately, we're still uh, fighting uh, with our administration uh, to get our sonographers trained. I think everyone's in agreement that they should be doing it, but uh, I think it, it, it may be uh, easier to get uh, a psychotron um, than it is to uh, get a, uh, our, our sonographers to, to give contrast. It's been very frustrating for us because we know that many labs, even in our state, are giving are the nurses are, are the sonographers are giving contrast, starting the IVs uh, and giving contrast. Uh, but uh, there's still quite a lot of regional variability in that. But I think more and more labs are, are are recognizing that sonographers can start their own IVs, and even the training schools are are, are getting uh, better at uh, training sonographers and making it part of their training to learn how to start IVs. Uh, and administer ultrasound enhancing agents. I think it should be part of every, any sonographer curriculum now uh, because of, of the value that it, it gives us and, and the need for that when you hire someone that they already have that experience. Uh, what's been your, what's going on in England with that? Uh, uh, yeah, so so, uh, so as, as you've said, you know, I work in two hospitals, <laughs> uh, Brompton and Norfolk Park. Uh, so two hospitals, in the two different hospitals, you've got two different modes of uh, you know uh, uh, using the uh, uh, using contrast. So at the Royal Brompton Hospital, we have got fellows every day. We have a fellow cover for stress echo. So so they are there. They can they give contrast, and the sonographers take the images. So it's it's you know there's no problem at all. Uh, we have also nurses in at Brompton, where it's if the if the uh, fellow is taken up, you know, to uh, by another. Uh, uh, the, if the fellow needs to go somewhere else to uh, attend the patient, then the uh, nurses come along and give contrast. Uh, we have the same problem with the sonographers giving, uh, you know, starting I, uh, giving contrast. Essentially, they can start the I, they can uh, uh, cannulate, but they're not allowed to give contrast. Uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is unbelievable, but um, that's how the hospital functions. The nursing department don't feel that the, the uh, that uh, sonographers can give contrast. Now, in my other hospital, it works slightly differently. There's a there is a um, um, a pathway called patient specific directive. It's quite a uh, you know clever way of doing it. So all that needs to be done is for a doctor. You say, okay, the sonographer can give contrast and they just sign it and give it to the sonographer and the sonographer gives contrast. So there at Northwick Park, 
uh, they all can cannulate and even at Brompton they can cannulate. But at there they can give contrast on the basis of the doctors signing them off. So the doctors take the responsibility and signs them off and then they can give contrast. Okay, <laughs> so it needs kind of like a doctor's order. Uh, yeah, correct. So you need a doctor's order. So you need a doctor around at that time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the complexities of that, as you can see, yeah. vary from hospital to hospital. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I think the American Society of Echo and the European Society uh, of Echo have all, all come out very strongly in support of sonographer uh, training to start IVs and to administer contrast, uh, because that's, that's just critical um, and became very critical during the COVID epidemic because uh, they weren't having to wait for a nurse to come and give the yeah. ultrasound enhancing agent uh, uh, to decrease exposure time. So we're hopeful that we'll get more uniform uh, uh, acceptance of that. And I think it's just, we just have to keep uh, all working hard at, and emphasizing that sonographers should have that capabilities. The next one kind of is a, a, a kind of a, a, um, a dovetail to that. It says, what percentage of your stress echo patients do you use ultrasound enhancing agents? Um, we do all of our dopamine stress echoes with ultrasound enhancing agents, as Dr. Senior said. Uh, and then the exercise echoes, uh, still we're probably about 98% using uh, ultrasound enhancing agents. So unless we have someone that's uh, uh, is clearly either refusing an IV or, or uh, has you know, very pristine windows and has such low probability, we don't, uh, or they're getting it for like an aortic stenosis assessment or some kind of valvular disease assessment, uh, then we don't use the, necessarily use the ultrasound enhancing agent. Uh, uh, which, and, and, uh, Roxy, I think you had said that you use the, uh, less so during exercise, uh, but almost all the time during dobutamine, is that right? No, actually both. Exercise and dobutamine, it's, uh, you know, it's as high as 98, even, I mean, you know, I want it to be 100%, but patients do refuse. So, in fact, with exercise, it's very helpful to give contrast yes. because the heart moves, you, you get the images straight away. It really helps during exercise. Yes. And all, uh, and, and uh, you know, in fact, we, uh, at the, at the um, uh, in both the hospitals, about 70% of the patients are exercise stress echoes and 30% is dobutamine. Now we even give contrast with valvular heart disease because mm. the, the way we look at it is we, we give the contrast to look at wall motion and everything, but then we quickly clear the micro bubbles with, you know, uh, uh, with color, flow, color Doppler and all that. And then we get the valvular information. Certainly for stenosis, you know, you, you can get nice images yes. or um, uh, the Doppler flow, but even when we're assessing mitral regurgitation, uh, if you get rid of the contrast, you really don't get the, uh, you know, odd effect of contrast enhancing, you know, mitral regurgitation or something. Right. Well, that's very interesting because, uh, yeah, it certainly enhances the jet. Uh, we haven't really known what to do with that information yet. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it enhances the jet. But if you look at the PISA, you know, that doesn't change very much. That's very, uh, that's very independent of... Uh, Theoretically, it should not change. That's very yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. A good uh, uh, something to uh, consider for the valvular yeah. assessment because we've been asked to do that more frequently. Um, so, well, anyway, I think we'll turn it over then to uh, Matt again. Are you there? Yes, yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Porter and uh, Dr. Senior.